Today we'll be going over the process of rebuilding an 88 Kawasaki 650SX two-stroke jet ski engine. I purchased this ski in the spring of 2020 and spent most of the summer fixing water cooling, bilge pump, starter relay, battery charging, and haul issues. I did eventually get out to actually ride the ski a few times before winter, but now that we're officially in the off season, I decided to yank the motor and perform a rebuild so that next season will be more riding, less wrenching. You'll notice in this video that I don't have much in the way of a proper workspace. I'm working in a backyard shed, which is hardly removed from the elements. The work surface here is a sheet of plywood mounted to my table saw. In other words, don't be discouraged from attempting this process if you don't have a pristine workspace either. In order to keep track of the fasteners, I bought a set of simple plastic parts bins from the dollar store. I started at the lowest bin and worked my way upward as an alternative to labeling the individual containers. In anticipation for the rebuild, I ordered a complete gasket set from SBT. I also bought a set of grinding and sanding burrs for my die grinder. We'll get into their application later in this video when we dive into porting and polishing the air passageways. For now, we'll begin with the teardown of the engine. In preparation for removal of the cylinder head and lower cases, I removed the nuts and sprayed WD-40 on the studs, letting the penetrant soak in while I moved on to other components. The carburetor bolts have retaining clips to keep the hex heads from backing out. You simply need to pry them downward with a screwdriver, allowing removal of the bolts. The flywheel cover has an access port. I like to pull this cap so I have something to hold on to when pulling it off. There are two alignment studs beneath, so you'll want to gently tap the cover as you pull, dislodging it from these studs. The flywheel is a notoriously stubborn part to remove. You'll need a harmonic balancer puller to start. Once you've acquired the tool, you want to thread the three M8 by 1.25 bolts into the flywheel. Make sure not to go too far with these bolts, as they'll damage your stator that way. Next, you'll want to tighten the center puller bolt against the crank. I like to place a small washer in between this bolt and the crank to avoid damaging either. Once you've applied torque to this bolt, grab a hammer and start smacking the bolt itself. What you're doing here is applying some shock to the system. After a few smacks with the hammer, see if the bolt has loosened. Tighten it again and repeat the process. Have patience and eventually the flywheel will pop loose. The flywheel is lined with magnets, so don't be fooled if it feels a bit stuck to the stator even after clearly being freed from the crank. Also, locate the Woodruff key and put it somewhere safe. If it seems damaged, you can replace it with the 13mm keyway, 3mm wide Woodruff key from McMaster Car. I had to buy a pack of 25, so feel free to comment below if you need it. I don't mind mailing you one. Next to remove is the starter Bendix. It just falls out once the flywheel is out. Again, watch for the washer that accompanies this part. Before you remove the stator, look at its orientation. Its position determines your timing and can be adjusted by rotating this part along its slots. It's a pain to access once back in the ski, so I try my best to reinstall it exactly how I found it. You're supposed to have access through the flywheel, but that's not been my experience. Mine doesn't quite have enough room to avoid removing the flywheel to reach these stator bolts. <laughs> 
To thread the stator wires out, you'll need to remove their collar, then fish them through one at a time. Remember the cylinder head studs we soaked with WD-40? Well, hopefully the penetrant did its job and pulling the head is as simple as can be. The intake and exhaust manifolds are straightforward. You'll just want to watch for the intake reads once the manifold is removed. Place these somewhere safe before continuing. In my case, the exhaust manifold was missing a nut. I miked it and used a thread pitch comb to determine the size. The starter motor is another slightly stubborn part to remove. The key here is to use a drift of some sort and hammer on the starter gear. You shouldn't have to use much force, but it does take a few swings to get it to break free. The nuts on the cylinder body can be hard to reach. I chose to get them started with a six point box end wrench and a dead blow hammer. Once they were broken free, I again applied some WD-40 to the studs to make removal a breeze. To break the body away from the lower case, you'll want to shock the system with a dead blow hammer. The key here is to hit the thicker sections of the casting. Take your time and work around the case and eventually it will break free. Do not rely on prying at the body ears, or you risk breaking them off. Now we can move on to the fun part, porting and polishing the airways. The amount I removed from the cylinders was minimal, and I'm mainly focused on chamfering and polishing the edges where air has to break over the walls. During this process, I alternated between carbide burrs, sanding cones, and flap wheels. On the intake side, I kept the polishing to a minimum, since some turbulence is good for the mixture of the air and fuel. I could have done a more extensive job in the center of the cylinders if I had a low-profile pencil grinder. Instead, I just rounded some of the edges and focused more on the areas I could reach with my straight-end grinder. I did, however, spend time smoothing the surfaces on the exhaust side. Once the grinding and sanding was complete, I used a wire brush, razor blade, and sanding stone to clean the gasket material and other debris from the mounting surfaces. The sanding stone is helpful since it can span the face and ensure the flat surface is maintained. I inspected the cylinder walls and pistons, deciding not to hone or replace either. Now, once I got the upper end apart, I sort of jumped into the porting job and forgot about the rest. Eventually though, I returned to the lower case, separating the halves and freeing the crank. All I was really concerned with here was cleaning the case halves, inspecting the pistons and rings, and reassembling with new seals and gaskets. In the midst of this disassembly, I needed to remove the crank coupler. I tried my best to fashion a brace of sorts to unthread it, but it was pretty well seized in place and I had to break out the saw. 
Luckily this is an easily sourced part, so I chopped off and discarded the old one. For the seal assembly, I bought a container of assembly goo. I packed the seals with as much of this as I could fit. This should hopefully prolong the life of the seals for a very long time. Everywhere else that could take it, I dabbed engine assembly lube. It probably wasn't necessary, but it always gives me a warm and fuzzy feeling to have plenty of lubricant surrounding the crank. The case halves go together with 3 bond 1211 sealant. A tube of this stuff costs over $20, and you only need a very teeny tiny bit. Luckily, a friend had sealed his case a couple months ago, so I knew he'd have some leftover. I followed the manual for torque specs, but did cheat a bit on the cylinder body nuts. Since I didn't have a crow's foot socket, I torqued one of the more accessible nuts and got a feel for it by hand. Then I just applied roughly the same torque to the rest of the nuts. It isn't precise, but I'm satisfied it'll do. Since this engine will likely sit in the shed until spring, I decided to apply engine assembly lube to the cylinder walls also. Hopefully this will protect the surfaces and ensure a trouble-free start a few months in the future. Other than that, reassembly is very much the opposite of disassembly, just with new gaskets and seals. <laughs>